All right. Welcome everyone to today's special Magna Carta webinar featuring Professor Michael Humer. We'll be discussing a book that we have no idea when is coming out at this point, <laughs> but I was lucky enough to get an advanced copy. So we will have a lot to discuss and you will be clamoring at the publisher to get that very soon. Professor Michael Humer is a professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado Boulder and author of the previously mentioned book entitled Justice Before the Law. And I wrote in my notes that it was due to be released this summer. I am now given to believe that may not be the case. <laughs> we really don't have a good estimate. But in this book, Professor Humer explores the largest injustices in the legal system and what can be done about them. Now, besides proposing institutional reforms, he argues that prosecutors, judges, lawyers, and key for us, jury members, ought to place justice before the law. For example, by refusing to enforce unjust laws or impose unjust sentences. In addition to covering jury nullification in this new book, he has also covered the subject in a previous book entitled The Problem with Political Authority, a paper entitled The Duty to Disregard the Law, and a chapter entitled A Defense of Jury Nullification in the Palgrave Handbook of Philosophy and Public Policy. Welcome and thank you for joining us today, Mike. All uh, right, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's uh, good to be here. <laughs> uh, Professor Humer, you generously provided me with an advanced copy of your manuscript, which I have read voraciously. So thank you very much for that. First of all, I felt like I had my hand in the cookie jar the whole time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's clearly not possible to cover this in depth in an hour. So I'm just going to give our audience a quick heads up that someday after the book comes out, we will be scheduling a three or four week book discussion group. And uh, I was going to say that currently it was set for release on July 27th, but that is apparently not correct. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I will, I will tell the audience what I told you that um, you know, first it said June, and then now it says July, and then the, um, you know, publisher or whatever, the person who's supposed to be preparing the files told me November. Oh my goodness and, gracious. Know, I, I gave them the complete manuscript months ago. I think I gave it to them last November. So oh my goodness. <laughs> like a year or something like that. And, um, you know, it, during the meantime, I prepared, I self-published another book during which time I did everything that they're supposed to be doing right now to prepare the thing for publication within oh a few weeks. Right? Oh, that is brutal. That is excruciating. Right? If you do it <laughs> you do it yourself, you can get it done in a couple of weeks. But if uh, if a oh. does it, it's gonna take like a year. This is such a timely book too. Why aren't they all over this? But don't get me started. Yeah, it's, al it's always timely. I mean, yes. that's stuff. that's sad, sad to say, but true. That's very sad to say, but true. Well, I have a pretty long list of questions, just kind of touching on some of the highlights, most specifically related to the mission of the Fully Informed Jury Association. And we'll see how many of those we can cover. But I'll also try to fold in some audience questions along the way. If you are on Zoom, you can hover over the bottom of your screen and click on a feature called Q&A and pop your question in there. And I will keep an eye on that first and foremost. I also have my cell phone scrolling the Facebook <laughs> broadcast. So if you are on Facebook, please feel free to make a comment and I will try to wander an eyeball off in that direction occasionally and grab any questions you may have there. And with that, let's get started. Uh, my first, first, I wanted to kind of get a feel for like what led you to write this book and now, or yeah. last November. <laughs> well, yeah, it was a couple of years ago. I mean, I had a sabbatical at which, which I spent the year at uh, Tulane University because they had like a whatever research fellowship thing, something. So, um, and the reason why I wanted to do legal philosophy was kind of because uh, it seemed to me like there are like there were a few doctrines that are um, orthodox views in the field, and especially among practitioners, and sort of to a lesser extent among scholars, which I thought are totally indefensible. 
just like completely dumb and are held with near total confidence by the supposed experts in the field and like they will just say dismissive things. So like when you're doing research on jury nullification, you find these comments from judges saying, oh, it's a completely indefensible doctrine. And then if they attempt to explain their reason why it's, it's so bad, they give some completely stupid arguments. <laughs> so I thought like, wow, this is just gonna be, this is the low hanging fruit, right? <laughs> It's just like, you know, just knock this, this aside <laughs> anyway. Well, right. I was really excited for you in particular to do this. I won't out them, but a friend of mine said they won't read your book on veganism because you are so clear and convincing in everything you write that they're afraid it will put them off of meat. So <laughs> I was like, that is exactly who we need writing about this. <laughs> you see, saying that, shows that you already know that you're wrong. So <laughs> already, already. Well, I wrong. think they're just worried. <laughs> what, what if what if you're right? Oh no, bacon. <laughs> no. no, I can't. I don't want to find out, right? Right. This is, this is analogous to um, you know, actually there, you know, there's an issue like this in legal philosophy also, but it's analogous to, you know, I'm driving around with my eyes closed and I don't want to open my eyes because what if I see a kid in front of a car? <laughs> See, we can't go on. No. This is terrible. That's why you need to open your eyes. <laughs> well, well, I definitely felt like I almost from the very beginning of this book was seeing like that clarity, it, like shining bright. And the, the first thing I came across and I was like, oh, this is the perfect way to put this. Um, you put forth two ways of looking at and responding to injustice in the legal system. In the categories you identified were primacy of authority and primacy of justice, which is a huge thing that I have to kind of uh, illuminate for people to help them understand jury nullification. Can you give us a little bit of uh, commentary on what you mean by each of those and how they are different from each other? Yeah, so I mean, you know, first you have to recognize that there could be a conflict between justice and the law, right? So there, sometimes there are unjust laws. Uh, that has always been true in the past. It's probably still true now, right? So it's easy to give past examples like the, the fugitive slave laws, right? These are laws in the North that required you to return escaped slaves to their masters in the South, right? Mm -hmm. Unjust law. And by the way, that, that um, frequently resulted in jury nullification. And they had trials under those laws, like the jury would refuse to convict because they just thought it was unjust because slavery was unjust. Um, you know, but today maybe uh, maybe the drug laws would be a good example, right? And so yeah, the primacy of justice is the idea that well justice takes priority over being faithful to the law. And you know the, pri the primacy of authority is no, we just have to defer to what the authority figures say, even if they're wrong, right? <laughs> even if they're apparently morally wrong. Um, yeah, so, you know, what, okay, why, why hold one of these views, right? I mean, basically, I think the purpose of the legal system, the whole thing, the purpose of the whole thing is justice. Like, why we have trials in anything, <laughs> why we have this whole thing is we're trying to do justice. Like, somebody has done something wrong, and they justly deserve to be punished. And that's why you hold trials, mm -hmm. to find out if they did it, right, and then to decide what is the appropriate remedy. Um, or they didn't do something wrong, they were falsely accused, then the purpose is to have them, you know, set free as justice requires, right? And like, you know, just like there's all kinds of aspects of the system that make it clear that it's aiming, it's supposed to be aiming at justice. Um, the means to an end can't be more important than the end itself. So if the purpose of the law is to achieve justice, it can't be that the law is more important than justice. To, so, to my know, left, I have a whiteboard with a bunch of little uh, thought snippets that I review every day, and I'm going to put that one on when we're done. <laughs> that, is, that is a very good thing for people to keep in mind, and it's so often obscured in the legal system, like during voir dire, people are being specifically asked more and more, will you follow the judge's instructions even if you don't agree with them, even if you think the law is wrong, will you enforce it? And if you don't okay. say yes. Yeah, so so obviously you should just lie. Say yes. 
Um, okay, but you know, obviously that's a um, that's an immoral thing to ask, right? You know, first yeah. of all, no person of good conscience could agree to do that. No and person yet, of, <laughs> no person of good conscience can agree to do whatever another person tells them mm -hmm. without knowing what it's going to be. Yeah. Right. Let let me run this kind of i've given a lot of thought to this because i don't like lying but i also think sometimes it's necessary but then i thought how how much of a lie is it really and here's my thought process and maybe you can uh, tell me if i'm on a, a reasonable track or or if there's another way to look at it that's better nobody who's who says that yes they will follow the judge's instructions if and if then subsequently instructed by the judge to shoot the juror next to them yeah. would follow that instruction. So I think when you're saying <laughs> yes, I. Right. <laughs> you know, if you if you've it's seen scary. the Melbourne experiment, right? They would they would elect. Yeah. <laughs> they would shoot All right. It. Nobody <laughs> nobody would yeah. say that they would. <laughs> if I if I pose this hypothetical question, everyone would agree that no, you should then break your uh -huh. promise. So I kind of look at it like I'm going to I'm going to say yes in the on the good faith presumption that that person is going to instruct me accurately and completely and if they say something wrong about jury nullification or fail to say something about jury nullification well they've kind of broken their end of that so it's not particularly a lie if I'm intending to follow all of their correct instructions yeah. But jury nullification to me is part of that. <laughs> so, I mean, so. Well, I mean, like in the in the first example, um, you didn't know that he was going to tell you to shoot the juror next to you. But in the other example, you kind of know that like, he's, he's going to tell you to just implement the unjust law. Yeah. Um, so was a reliability engineer in my former life and and so i'm very big on i can't predict the future <laughs> i mean i can under certain circumstances but it's not really a prediction i mean yeah. we, we just kind of have expectations based on history uh, but i like i'm not a mind reader if he doesn't tell me that up front i didn't i didn't know yeah, yeah. you think i you think i'm just rationalizing though <laughs> um, i should just own that i'm gonna go in and lie about it <laughs> i know I mean, you know, like I have this example in um, which I've used repeatedly that, you know, you're you're with your friend, you know, walking around in the city, your friend who's gay, and like this gang of hoodlums comes up to you and they ask you if your friend is gay, and um, they're they're obviously planning to beat him up, right? If he is, All right? So what do you say? Obviously, you should lie to them, right? Okay, and you know, like gangs of hoodlums. Gangs of homophobic hoodlums do not have a right to know other people's sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. right, so, like, you know, a more subtle moral principle is that okay. it's wrong to deceive people about things that they have a right to know. Okay. Or have a right to ask, right? Okay. But, like, he's got no right to ask you. Yeah. You know, if you're going to nullify the law or whatever, he's undermining the whole point of the jury system. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I definitely uh, have no problem uh, looking at them as gangs of hoodlums. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's a, a pretty good analogy there. Um, uh, one thing that you wrote in your book is that uh, I'm going to quote here in criminal cases, for example, individuals should be punished if and only if they have committed wrongs serious enough to deserve punishment and then they should be punished proportionately to the seriousness of those wrongs and their culpability for them. Now, one thing that kind of occurred to me is that like the situation if you're when you're actually sitting there as a juror, it's not usually that simple because there are different things you as a juror can affect and you can affect them to different degrees. For instance, jurors usually can decide guilty or not guilty straight up like that's that's pretty straightforward if they know about their jury rights they can do that more or less clearly but most of the time and there are some exceptions they don't decide the punishment nonetheless whether they vote guilty or not guilty indirectly affects that because that's what opens the door for them to be able to be punished so 
let's say a juror believes that someone did commit a wrong that is serious enough to deserve punishment, but they know like maybe about three strikes laws where if it's your, even if it's a very minor offense, it's the third offense and now you're going to prison for 20 plus years and you think that's unjustly disproportionate, how should they weigh those sorts of things uh, when they're coming to the, the decision on that guilty or not guilty? Should that yeah. be part of it or should those be separate? How, wh what are some thoughts on how we can I mean, do I that? think it should be part of it. So the judge will not tell you what the sentence will be, but you can look it up and you know, go, go on Google or whatever. Uh, and you know, there's like sentencing guidelines which make it pretty predictable unless you have a very unusual judge, right? So like occasionally a judge gives a sentence that, that diverges significantly from the sentencing guidelines, okay? But that's pretty rare, so you can pretty well predict it. Um, and, then, um, and then I think you just have to kind of think, okay, so given what the sentence is, is it more just for the person to get that sentence or for him to go free, right? Because by the way, like almost everyone who's in a trial is guilty. Okay. Um, oh, by the way, like that's among the like, you know, 50 different things that would get me excluded from a jury. The fact yeah, that don't I don't say know, that, please. <laughs> I know that like 95% of the people are guilty. Yeah. I'm not an idiot. Like I know he's probably guilty. Anyway, so that's going to get me kicked off. But, um, anyway, so, and if it's actually um, like what the person did is actually wrong, that they should be punished for. But sometimes you think, wow, like when you hear the sentence, you're gonna go, that's crazy, right? So like one of the cases discussed in the book was um, this guy who had forged a check for $88 and he wound up getting life imprisonment, right? And that was partly because it, it was a yeah. repeat offense, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So it was like, and I guess forgery was a felony. So it was his third felony conviction, right? Uh, and it also because he refused the plea bargain. So he mm -hmm. would have gone five years with the plea bargain. And then they went to life imprisonment because he asked for a trial. Anyway, so if you knew that, you should say, yeah, this guy should be punished. But wow, the life imprisonment, that's like, I don't know, that's like a thousand times harsher than it should be. Yeah. I yeah. think it's more unjust for him to get that sentence than for him to go free. Okay. Obviously, there are like, there are difficult borderline cases that, you know, Mm -hmm. It's hard to say, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I will just mention for anyone who may be called on a jury, don't mention your thought process out loud during deliberations there, because if the judge finds out you're thinking about the sentence, you'll be removed from the jury. Even as late as deliberations, they can take you off the jury and replace you with an alternate. So right, yeah. go yeah, through that in your head. <laughs> My Recommendation is to pretend that you have doubts about the factual evidence. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I think that if you mention your real reasons in addition to doubts about the factual evidence, I think they um, can't exclude you. Although when I say they yeah. can't, it doesn't mean they won't. Right? Yeah, so. I, I've seen that. And what usually happens is this, they do exclude you, you're kicked off, the person's convicted, the person appeals and one of two things happens. Either the appeals court says, yes, that person should not have been excluded. We are overturning the conviction and sending it back and then it can be retried. And now you're not gonna have a fully informed juror on your jury. Alternatively, the court may say, yes, they shouldn't have kicked that person off, but it's harmless error. This is a, a terrible uh, concept where they say, eh, we already knew you're guilty or the evidence was so overwhelming that they would have cracked, you know, so. It, yeah. It's best to just do do as uh, our guest suggests there, and <laughs> stick to the reasonable doubt part. Right. Yeah. Um, quick note: one of our uh, uh, attendees says the audio, the sound on your speaker uh, on the speaker's end is echoey. Can you put in headphones? Which I'm pretty sure that's not a feedback issue, so that may not help. I think it might just be the the room you're in. But if you happen to have headphones, we could give it a shot. <laughs> uh. If not, not a super big deal. I have a thing, but um, it's not plugged in. All right. Well, while you're doing that, I don't know how you are at multitasking, but <laughs> um, one of the things that stood out for me uh, in your book that I had not really um, heard phrased this way or, or this issue raised before is 
that you say that criminal laws are presumptively unjust. Can you tell us what you mean by that? First, presumptively, and second, unjust. And yeah. uh, maybe give us an example. Oh. Yeah, OK, so is the sound better now? Oh, a lot. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you to our uh, uh, attendee who suggested that. <laughs> yeah, presumptively unjust means, well, it's unjust unless there's a sufficiently good reason for it. So uh, it does not mean most laws are unjust. OK, so compare the notion of presumption of innocence in a criminal trial. Presumption of innocence does not mean most defendants are innocent. That's false. Most of them are guilty. <laughs> but what it means is the person should be acquitted unless the prosecution provides sufficient evidence of guilt. All right, so presumptive injustice means it's unjust unless you know, the people who, pro who propose the law have sufficient reasons in favor of it. OK, and uh, what I mean by unjust is, well, violates people's rights you know, or treats people as they um, don't deserve. right? And uh, in this case, okay, why do laws presumptively violate people's rights? Well, because there's a general right against harmful coercion. So on the face of it, you should not harmfully coerce people. That doesn't mean that you can never do it, but it means that you need a good reason for it, right? So if there's not a good enough reason for the law, and so why do I say it's harmfully coercive? Because laws are enforced with some kind of punishment and the punishment isn't voluntary and it's generally harmful because that's the point of punishment, right? So somebody is going to break the law and then they're going to send the police after that person. They're going to basically kidnap that person, right? They won't call it kidnapping. They call it arresting, but anyway, they'll kidnap the person and lock them in a cage. And that is, and it's going to be a really shitty experience for that person. So um, there needs to be a good enough reason for doing that. Mm -hmm. There doesn't have to be a reason not to have a law. Mm -hmm. There has to be a reason to have the law. Otherwise it's unjust. Mm -hmm. And so could you give like maybe a, an example of how conscientious jurors in practice might kind of incorporate this into their thinking and, and outcomes? Well, it just results in there being a larger number of unjust laws than you might have thought, right? Like somebody makes a law and you just like can't see why we need that law, then it's unjust, right? Uh, I should say, like, not just that you can't see it, but if you look for the reasons, the reasons are stupid or they like nobody gave any reason mm -hmm. for it. Right. Um, but, you know, you have to like try to figure out why they made the law and not just assume. Mm -hmm. Okay. But anyway, yeah. So there's probably a lot more unjust laws than most people think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I give the example of the drug laws because that's very common. I think mm -hmm. that's the most common unjust law that people are being prosecuted for. Um, but I think like there are probably a bunch of regulations. Um, I think it's pretty rare to have criminal penalties. So it'd be pretty rare to have an actual trial for violating a regulation, right? But, you know, I'm but- not, you know. I'm not sure about that. That's a good yeah. question, huh? I mean, I think huh. usually, I think usually you just pay a fine. You're not gonna go to trial or anything. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, if that if that comes up, like, you know, somebody has violated some business regulation and it's just like no good rationale for it. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't have to be like a horrible, horribly wrong idea. It just has to be that there's no good reason for it. Then mm -hmm. the person shouldn't be punished. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I since I have a philosopher here <laughs> and we're, we're in the philosophy factory, I feel comfortable-ish uh, dragging us into the gray area repeatedly, and I'm going to do that now. Um, I think for a lot of people, drug laws, which are often referred to as victimless offenses or victimless crimes, it's pretty clear cut. But let's talk about some uh, situations maybe where it's not quite as clean cut. Um, the way I read what you're saying in the book seems to divide laws up into just and unjust laws, but are the categories really that clean cut? And I have a specific example in mind. Um, there, this is an actual case. There was a man who in his 40s went and um, punched a priest uh, who was an elderly priest. And normally we would say, hey, laws against assault, that is a just law. Yeah. But, but it turns out that this priest had sexually abused him repeatedly as a child. His life had been 
so destroyed in so many ways. Uh, he was not able to get this person prosecuted because the statute of limitations had run out, but felt he needed some closure. And so he tracked this person down with the intention of approaching him just to get him to at least admit out loud what he had done. And when he got there, he perceived that person to have leered at him in a way that he felt was familiar from his abuse in childhood and had a moment of uh, emotion that resulted in him slugging the guy. So he was prosecuted for felony assault, elder abuse, and misdemeanor assault. And in fact, his, he took a jury trial, testified on his own behalf, said, yes, I did this. I wouldn't do it again. I wouldn't put myself in a position again where I would be you know, that emotional again. I regret that I did it. I think it was wrong, but here's why I did it and was uh, acquitted, found outright not guilty of felony assault and elder abuse and got a hung jury eight to four on the misdemeanor assault charge. <laughs> so- Wait, sorry, eight to four in favor of acquittal of con or- Convicting, convicting. So eight eight yeah. favor to convicting and four. Yes. Yeah, okay. I actually okay. looked that up because I was like, that's an interesting split. <laughs> Um, yeah. So it, it kind of speaks to how divided people were over whether he deserved any punishment at all. Yes. Yeah. Particularly in light of the fact that the abuser could not be prosecuted. And in fact, the prosecution, the abuser testified and it was so widely believed that he was an abuser that the prosecution considered um, prosecuting him for perjury because he t testified that he hadn't done anything to him. <laughs> So they were just trying to find a way to make him accountable. Um, but everyone seemed to agree with that. He, of course, had not been convicted of that. But it, right, it's, yeah. it's kind of a so, sticky situation. So your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, I would have voted to acquit on all charges, I guess. Um, so, I mean, so like the reasons for our jury nullification, the reason, the general reason is that you think that the conviction would result in an injustice. One kind of injustice is it's just an unjust law, but that's not the only kind, right? So another kind is where you think the punishment would be excessive. Another kind is where, you know, like maybe, maybe the punishment is reasonable for like, you know, what the statutory offense is. And also it's a reasonable statute, but they're just special, very unusual circumstances for this particular defendant, which is what I think you're describing here, right? Like yeah. I, wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to make a general rule. I don't want to change the law. I don't want to change the punishment for the law in general. Right. But I just think this particular person mm -hmm. has extenuating circumstances. Mm -hmm. And like, I think that's, that's totally reasonable. Is there a, we we obviously don't get into codifying laws to this specific level of detail. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the jury has often been described as sort of the uh, I forget what it's called the the, the the outlet that like release the pressure valve that like takes care of these kinds of situations. But is there what would be the reason that it's unjust in this case to to prosecute yeah. him? Well, um, or punish him? Maybe yeah. not prosecute. Yeah, was it wrong to punch the priest? Uh, not sure it was wrong. <laughs> right? Like, okay, so the priest deserved to be punished, right? Now you want to say, yeah, but you know, you should shouldn't take the law into your own hands. Like, call the police, whatever. <laughs> Have a neutral third party arbitrate the dispute. But the thing is, the way you've described it, he can't do that. The government has already refused to prosecute, right? Or it's against their rules. So there, you already know for sure that you have no other recourse. <laughs> so like. I don't even really think that it's wrong. Like, and like being punched is like a pretty small punishment. Yeah. Right? It's like, you know, he would have gotten many years in prison, which would have been way worse yeah. if he'd been, you know, prosecuted under the law. So I don't know. I feel like he got off light and like, you know, yeah. like he shouldn't be complaining. Yeah. Like the priest shouldn't be complaining about this. Yeah. I, I, I should look into it more because I don't know how much was, I, I guess you have to at least be a complainant to get well, I, I'm not totally sure how much the uh, victim needs to be involved in, in the prosecution, because I know there are uh, cases where rape victims are reluctant to testify and it, those cases still get prosecuted. 
So I should look into that a little more. Yeah. I mean, they might have physical evidence. That's the best right. kind of evidence. That's true. That's true. One of the big uh, issues, I think, for the jury system, you covered uh, in a chapter on the exorbitant cost of being involuntarily sucked into, i.e. in criminal cases, or even voluntarily using the legal system, like if it's a civil case. And you make the point that the overly burdensome cost of just participating in this calls into question the system's effectiveness as a justice system. And, and as you talked about before, the point of the system is to uphold justice, not just administer arbitrary laws for no apparent reason. Can, can you talk a little bit about how that cost calls that into question? Yeah, I mean, you know, like the, the short version is, look, um, only the rich can afford to seek justice through through the government's justice system right and you know if there's anything that's the government's responsibility it's to provide justice right like it's controversial well you know like anarchists like me don't even think that there should be a government at all but anyway everyone who believes in the government thinks that it has to provide justice because that's like you know one of the most fundamental functions right that's that's like a minimal that's state why function. we have it kind of thing right? <laughs> uh and you know like and also they're like taking money from us to provide the justice and they're also prohibiting anyone else from providing justice. Like nobody else can set up their own justice system. Uh, you can't set up your own police and like arrest people and then like you know investigate the crimes and put people on trial. Whatever the government will shut you down. So because they're charging us money for this thing and they're prohibiting us from getting it from anyone else, they're obligated to provide it, right? And then, but just the fact that so the the government has pat created a number of policies that predictably increase the prices of legal services and basically make it um, inaccessible for most people, right? And these policies have no good justification. And uh, you know it's like well some of them, the the actual motive for the policy is probably to increase prices. They're like actually attempting to make prices higher so that lawyers can get rich, which has the side effect of a whole bunch of people not being able to get legal services at all, mm -hmm. right? So, like, you know, this is all messed up. Right? <laughs> this is all this is all an injustice on the part of the state. Yeah. Um, just to kind of revisit our last uh, spot because I just noticed a couple of new questions here. Um, Ross is wondering, what do you think of statutes of limitations in general? Um, of course, people can die, memories can fade, but assuming none of those things that sort of degrade the quality of the case. What are your thoughts on having like that arbitrary up oh, 10 years we're done or whatever it is? Well, I like I see the rationale for it. You know, like that thing about like, you know, basically the evidence degrades. But um, I guess I I don't really think that we need this. I don't think we need statutes of limitations because um, like if the evidence has in fact degraded, then you just won't be able to prove the case. So it'll be too bad. But like like the only time the prosecutor would be bringing the case would be if he thinks that the evidence has not degraded so much that you can't mm -hmm. still get a conviction. Yeah. So, like, and obviously there can be exceptions. There mm -hmm. could be cases where you do still have the evidence that proves the person did the thing. So mm -hmm. if that happens, I don't know why you shouldn't be able to prosecute. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because technology has sort of changed that question because there is now, I've seen in the last couple of weeks, a couple of cases in Montana that were like 40 year old cold cases that were solved now because of DNA. And it's like, well, when technology changes that can kind of override the statute of limitations. Cause now where we thought we couldn't have evidence of good quality, suddenly we're like, oh, hey, there is a way. So yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting point you make. Yeah. Um, uh, I have another question from Ross, but I'm going to save Ross's till we get to that section. Uh, my dad, I can't call him by his first name because he's my dad. My dad wants, wanted to know, like, if the questioner has no right to a truthful answer, are you even lying? Does it even count? <laughs> huh. Here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm just going to inject here because this is a problem that I have that I got to crack to get more people on juries. No one wants to lie. No one wants to say it's a lie. I feel that very strongly. I don't like to lie, but are we, we're kind of, I feel like we're kind of rationalizing, but I also feel like maybe it's okay to rationalize that if that's what it takes for people to feel okay and get on. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't have a good rationalization to suggest, <laughs> um, but um, is it really lying? I mean, uh, yes, <laughs> lying is saying a thing that you don't believe, right? Asserting something you don't believe. So uh, you don't believe that you're just going to follow the judge's instructions, right? I mean, <laughs> you know that you're not, so I don't know. Um, but, you know, like I, um, I give analogies like this. So, you know, like, okay, there's, um, there's some terrorists who are like, um, they're gonna kidnap your neighbor. And like, you know, they've asked, hey, you know, is your neighbor a Jew or whatever? And if you say yes, they're just gonna like kidnap him and they're gonna hold him captive for 10 years. Okay, because that is comparable to what's gonna happen when, when the state convicts someone, right? Like depends on what the crime is, right? But they're gonna be held captive for like a long time in really shitty conditions, right? Where they'll probably be beaten up by other prisoners, whatever, whatever. Okay, so like these terrorists are asking you this question. And if you give the truthful answer, then they're gonna kidnap this innocent person and hold them captive for years in very bad, very like dangerous conditions. I mean, I do not feel bad about lying to the fucking terrorists. Just fucking lie to them. Just do it immediately, right? And um, yeah, and you know, like they're the terrorists don't have any complaint, right? They didn't they didn't have a right to that information. Plus, the only reason why you have to lie to them is to prevent them from doing an injustice. So like yeah. like the alleged victim of the wrong has no basis for complaint because it's like entirely their fault, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I've had a, a recurring pattern that is very interesting to me that maybe we can figure out a different way to crack. Uh, when you ask someone like, I know. Okay, it looks like, uh, looks like she's oh, cut out. I'll be back cut. momentarily. Am I back okay. yet? <laughs> You're back. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, what, what I was just saying is like, I, no, almost no person, like, let's leave aside Nazis and stuff, but almost nobody wants to say, oh, yeah, I would have totally turned Anne Frank's family in if I was, you know, in, in Nazi occupied territory and I was hiding Jews. I would, I would definitely come clean. I wouldn't lie. Nobody wants to say, oh, yeah, I'd turn over anyone who came to my house who was, if I was part of the Underground Railroad. Like, those are things we all almost universally seem to think, oh, that's a perfectly fine reason to lie. But suddenly when it comes to getting on a jury, even people who are big fans of jury nullification, I have had state contacts who are like, oh, I couldn't lie. And I'm like, how do I crack this? And, and I'm wondering maybe, maybe instead of trying to figure out a way for them to feel like it's not a lie, maybe the answer is we have to like, and, and I hesitate to compare it to slavery and the Holocaust because obviously the order of magnitude of those things is far greater, but yeah. it's sort of on the, on the I mean, spectrum over towards that direction. Yeah, so like, I don't think this is an unfair comparison, right? So like the being enslaved, I think is a comparable harm to being imprisoned. Um, you know, like the prison term, usually ends earlier <laughs> so it's like okay it's not as bad because like you're going to get out and whatever yeah. but i think it's qualitatively similar uh at the during um you know nazi germany when they were rounding up the jews in fact uh nobody knew what was going to happen to them all they knew was that they were being sent to prisons so that is comparable like what people knew That's at the time true. is comparable to what you know when you're um on the jury like this person is just going to be yeah. held captive somewhere that's an excellent point and so kind of kind of related to that jerry is asking is prison a just thing on the face of it um, and i think you'll know this reference he says bob murphy has many interesting arguments about systems alternative to jail including voluntary segregation where people are told they can re-enter society after working off their debt would civil damages always be more reasonable as punishment and after you answer, I might answer too, because I have some thoughts there as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, civil damages are usually more reasonable, right? I mean, it might not count as punishment, right? But most of the time, if there's a crime, well, there should be a victim. If there wasn't a victim, then I, you shouldn't be prosecuting at all, right? But so there's a victim, so pay the victim some compensation. I think there are some cases where this isn't really a viable approach. So like you have this um, serial killer well you can't just have him pay <laughs> like whatever <laughs> like 
uh, he's got to be either executed or held in prison for the rest of his life, right? Like I think about the case of Ted Bundy and like, um, you know, they, they arrested him one time, one time he escaped from the jail because he's like a master manipulator, okay? The reason he escaped was that the guards left him alone in the library by himself and he climbed out the window. It was a second story window, okay? But he climbed out and jumped down. And then he murdered two more people before they caught him again. Okay, anyway, so like if you have a guy like that, he can never be free, right? It's like, it's not good enough to say he's gotta pay some money. Like he has to be held captive or killed, right? Which is what they ultimately did. Yeah, that was kind of where I was going. There are, to me, some people who have to be permanently removed from society. I don't think we necessarily have to be um, cruel to them, but they do need to at least be isolated out of society. Um, there, I, I will mention there, there is quite a lot of discussion though over um, how, how much uh, or what kind of penalty is necessary and like is, is even incarceration serving any real purpose or is it just making things worse in certain cases? Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's, yeah, well, it's, definitely, it's definitely overused. So, um, you know, like there, so I think something like half of the prisoners are violent criminals. So the other half are either property criminals or drug criminals. Okay, there's, there's more property crimes than drug crimes, but they get shorter sentences. So that's why they're, okay, yeah. small. So, uh, but those people should pretty much be let out. Yeah. So one of the things that um, kind of is a, stumps me a bit um, as I think about how would I vote in certain cases is suppose you have someone who is a repeat offender of very petty crimes. <laughs> like they're constantly, you know, stealing, you know, a, a case of beer from the, from various convenience stores. Like I want yeah. them to stop, <laughs> yeah. but I also don't want them to go to a facility where they're going to be raped, assaulted, possibly killed, where they will be tortured in isolation, where taxpayers are spending far more money than the cost of the beer to yeah. you know keep them there and where they're going to now if they get out are not going to be able to support themselves nearly as easily because now they have this record and all these employment opportunities will be taken like this it just doesn't seem optimal but as a juror like you can't fix all that <laughs> you get to say guilty or not guilty um is is that something we should even be thinking about in those sorts of cases? Or is that, I mean, I guess I don't know how not to think about that in those sorts of cases. Like I want, yeah. I want the, the person or people who are being stolen from to be made right, but neither yeah. option I have is going to do that. I don't think. No, that's right. So, I mean, like, okay, so what should happen is he should have to pay for the beer and like a little yeah. extra for the trouble that he caused everybody, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, uh, jury member doesn't really have the option of making that happen. Uh, in theory, the store owner can sue the guy, but that's not gonna happen. Um, partly because the thing that we discussed earlier, the prohibitive expense of the legal system, right? Like, you're not gonna sue somebody for a six yeah. pack of beer, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, and, um, and even if you won, you probably couldn't collect. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, it, so, it seems non-optimal. I mean, yeah, I mean, like collecting from most criminals requires forced labor, right? Mm -hmm. so most of them don't have the money, yeah. right? Or they can't be trusted to, to pay. Yeah. Right? Um, but yeah, so, you know, what should the jury member do? I don't know. I mean, I think like you can, you can consider whether you think this sentence is just, right? Mm -hmm. Like look up what the sentence would be and then, you know, like, so if it's gonna be 10 years, I'd be like, no, I guess it's better to let them go. Mm -hmm. It's like if you steal, if you steal beer like a hundred times in your life, that's still not as bad as a ten-year sentence <laughs> in prison. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's yeah. I for me, I feel like I would be tempted to just vote not guilty and find out where he stole from and give him twenty bucks or whatever. <laughs> I mean, I, not that it fixes the problem, but you know, I just I don't know. I. I it feels so harsh to, that people are coerced into, sorry, I get a little emotional. <laughs> it feels so harsh that people are coerced into that kind of moral dilemma against their will 
and yeah. aren't given the tools to deal with it. So, yeah, but, uh, you know, you know, you know, um, you know, almost all judges are against jury nullification. But like while I was doing research, like there are there, I found a couple that were in favor of it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So Ooh, I'm like going to have to talk to you about that later because I've got a list. <laughs> Like, yeah. So like there's a really good decision, US v. Datcher from 1993, mm -hmm. which I recommend looking up if you're a jury nullification fan, because mm -hmm. this was a very wise judge. And the the issue that was being decided, which, you know, you can find his rationale for, was um, the defense attorney wanted to argue the issue of excessive punishment to the jury. Mm -hmm. Um, and at first, I think at first the judge denied this and then later he allowed it. Um, and so the judge himself was not going to say anything about the punishment, but he let the defense attorney argue that the punishment was excessive or something. Mm -hmm. And then his rationale for this says, you know, like the only reason, like there are multiple features of the way the system works that indicate that it was intended to protect the possibility of jury nullification. Mm -hmm. And like his view was that the judge should not be encouraging it, but he can't be stopping it from happening. And one possible legitimate rationale for nullification would be that you think the punishment yeah. is excessive. So the jury has to be able to be informed about what the punishment would be yeah. in order to serve its function. Yeah. Actually, I was aware of one case in Georgia where the judge herself informed the jury that there was a three strike situation on the table. If he was convicted of a certain thing, Here's how much he was going to get. Go go off and make your decision. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. not telling you what to do. Here's just the context you might be interested in. There was a, a big to do over it, but I believe yeah. it stood. And then she retired or something. So that was sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, like many judges recognize the just excessive punishments that yeah. are going on um, because, like, the legislature has basically taken a bunch of discretion away from the judges, mm -hmm. which has resulted in sentences going way up. Mm -hmm. Right. And like there are many judges who know that this is like, um, you know, totally unjust. Right. That yeah. we have these really excessive. Yeah. One of the one of the things that uh, kind of relates to that um, in, in uh, the chapter on exorbitant cost, you said, um, and this is a quote here in general, as a matter of morality, as well as of law, I cannot justly require that you do X in order to see in to, order to receive Y if I already owe you why independently. And that got me to thinking about sort of another similar situation. Uh, there's a quantifiable phenomenon known as the trial tax where people who turn down plea bargains, and we've alluded to this earlier in the discussion, are punished far more severely if they're convicted in a trial by jury than the punishment they would have received if they took the deal. Now. Per the Constitution, the state already owes the accused a trial by jury. Would the sort of extra years that tax paid um, that in prison th that they yeah. risk to get their fair trial sort of be analogous there? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't refer to it as a tax because like the state doesn't get any benefit from it. In fact, the state gets a cost. Right. Oh. The criminal also gets a cost. Right? It's just bad oh, for everyone. Interesting. Right. But uh, but it is a penalty. Right. So it's an extra punishment. And in case anyone is wondering, um, on average, you get 3.3 times the sentence if you go to trial that you get from a plea bargain. Mm -hmm. That's how they get 97% of the mm -hmm. defendants to plea bargain. That's why there are yeah. very few trials, right? So, uh, and you know, the way I think of this is, well, they're just coercing the person to give up their right to a trial by threatening to triple the sentence. And um, you know, if if there's a non-zero chance that you're going to be convicted, there then you know they're increasing the potential punishment. Yeah. And you know, well, okay, you, well, you can't like coerce somebody to give up a right because, like, that's what right means. <laughs> you can't forcibly take I, it away. I, yeah. Oh my gosh. So kind of related to that, we'll we'll get a question from Ross, and then uh, I'll give you the the last word if you want it, or I'll squeeze in another question. Um, Ross asks, how, how best to handle the public benefit, private benefit conflict? Uh, he notes that it would be better, better socially for justice if more defense attorneys push their clients to go to trial, yet individually, it's usually best for clients to accept plea deals. Like what, yep. 
how, how do we how do we deal with this conundrum? Um, I mean, I'm not sure the first part of that is true. So if you're a lawyer, yeah, you should usually advise your client to take the plea bargain be, because he's going to get a triple the sentence, right? Assuming that yeah. he's likely to be convicted. And the actually, odds of losing. <laughs> I mean, actually, oddly enough, right? If the probability of being convicted is more than one third, yeah. Like, like it's a mathematical question. Right? You should, <laughs> then it's prudent to take the deal, which is insane. But anyway, okay. But if you go to trial anyway, like I don't see that that undermines the plea bargain system, right? That might just cause the, like if a lot of people do that, that might cause That's, them to just step up the trial penalty, uh -huh. right? Oh, interesting. Like, yeah. I, yeah. I, I took it to be as like flooding the system and making it so that you can't, you just can't prosecute all these, which I think uh, Michelle Alexander floated a few years ago, that idea that if black people just stop plea bargaining, they're going to have to do something. <laughs> After this pandemic, I will know, I'm not sure they would, because what, what I've been seeing lately is they're just like, they've told spe speedy trial deadlines, which means the last 14 months don't count against the speedy trial clock. Wow. And at least three states have either passed or are in the process of passing uh, legislation to stall speed or to to forestall speedy trial rights. And so, yeah, 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 I'm not not totally sure that strategy, which I once thought was a great idea, would necessarily yeah, work. No. <laughs> I mean, but, you know, um, I mean, most of these, like I like I say, like almost all these people are guilty. So like they should be punished. Right. So like, I mean, I don't want all these people going free. Right. I don't know. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask one more question related to that and then I'll give you the last word. So we kind of have this uh, idea and I, I assume it's historically accurate, but I haven't specifically researched it myself, that our system is premised on the notion that we are humans making judgments based on um, in, imperfect information, imperfect thinking skills, et cetera. So there's going to be error in the system no matter what, but it's better to err on the side of liberty and the uh, formulation, the famous Blackstone formulation, as it's put, says it's better to let 10 guilty people free rather than to convict or punish or harm one innocent person. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? You, you seem you seem more um, more overt about uh, reminding people that we do need to punish some people or at least, you know, yeah. seclude them. <laughs> so I'm kind yeah. of curious as to, do you think that's, what are your thoughts? You know, I feel sympathetic to that, although I'm not sure that it's correct. Maybe you know, not the specific math, but the yeah, general yeah. principle. Yeah, yeah. It's, so yeah, it's worse to punish yeah. someone unjustly than it is to fail to punish someone justly. Like, I agree with that. I don't know if it's 10 to one or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think like, but one of the reasons why we have this burden of proof is that that causes the police to do more investigation. If the standard of proof was preponderance of the evidence, then the police would stop investigating when they thought they, they had achieved like a 55% chance of guilt. And you don't want them to stop. You want them to make sure, right? Because like, yeah, okay, it's, you know, it's, maybe it's, it's better to get this criminal off the streets, but it's even better to be sure that he's really the criminal, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that's one of the things when I look back at what preceded trial by jury, like the uh, trial by uh, burning oil and you know, all the, the things that are considered barbaric, it's like, this is sort of, and I use the term loosely here, but this is sort of like putting some science to the process to make sure that we know what we're doing um, with specific yeah. individuals. So yeah, it's a, it's a little bit fuzzy when you get into the individual cases, but overall, I feel like that's kind of the right way to err in general. So, yeah, yeah. all right. Well, I want to give you the last word and then I will wrap it up just uh, letting people know where they can find uh, a bunch of things. Um, yeah. But do you have any last thoughts on, I, well, we barely scratched the surface of this book, I should add, so. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I mean, so I want to say like, so there's an obvious moral argument for jury nullification, which is, basically that you should not deliberately cause unjust harms or knowingly cause unjust harms. Like that seems pretty straightforward to me. Yeah, but I also wanna point out that I think there's like very strong legal arguments that this is the intended function. This is part of the intended function of a jury and that like 
there's not really a coherent rationale for why you need jury trials if you if you don't believe in jury nullification, right? Like there's there is nothing that you can reasonably think the jury would be better at than a professional judge other than deciding when you have to go against the law, right? Like judges are not good at that because they're biased in favor of the state. So, uh, and anyway, there's like, there's tons of statements from the founding fathers. There's like statements that are just very clear about why they, you know, they thought you needed a jury, which was, it was protecting against tyranny and there was no other rationale. And there's no way of understanding how it's protecting against tyranny if you just follow the directions of the judge. I mean, like, doesn't make sense. All right, and then, okay, anyway, so, and you know, and there's these features of the jury system that are widely accepted, like uh, the judge can give a directed verdict of not guilty, he cannot give a directed verdict of guilty, All right? So like, if he thinks the case is totally clear that the guy's innocent, he can tell the jury, you have to vote not guilty, or if they vote guilty, he can just like reject their verdict and say, just release the prisoner, but he can't do the reverse, right? So if he thinks it's totally clear the guy's guilty, he can't say you have to vote guilty, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, like the jury can give inconsistent verdicts. They could find you guilty of one thing and not guilty of another thing, even though like there's no possible way you could be guilty of the one and not the other, but it's still a valid verdict. Uh, like, you know, you can't appeal a case. Uh, so if the jury votes not guilty and then later they say, yeah, we just disregard the law, that's not a basis for an appeal by the prosecution. So like, and these are all very, like these are completely uncontroversial aspects of jurisprudence. There's no way of understanding all of this. Like, what is the rationale for all of this stuff? There's no way to understand that unless it's to protect jury nullification, right? So, yeah, uh, I, it's kind of, I feel like we need a whole nother hour. <laughs> yeah. Because because already I have some questions about those things, but we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll keep it uh, reasonable and not, not go there. But um, yeah, if anyone's interested in another webinar with uh, Professor Humor, let me know. And, and if, uh, if we have uh, some demand, I might see if I can sweet talk you into doing this again at some point. <laughs> um, for now, I just wanna thank you so much uh, for joining us and for writing this book, which is to me very important. Um, I just, I feel like this is the book that I, I want everyone to read about the justice system. And I gotta, gotta stop saying that I'm trying to call it the legal system because I don't think it has anything to do with justice. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is the book that I, if I could only give people one book to read, this would be it. So I'm looking forward to it coming out. Uh, for those of you on either Facebook or Zoom, I have shared some links in the chat and or comments, and I will send this out to the folks uh, who registered through Zoom afterward. But you can find uh, Professor Humor's blog and website at the links provided. Uh, I've also shared a link to Justice Before the Law on Amazon, where I suppose you can pre-order it, order it. And I cleverly used the Smile program link. So if you are uh, supporting another charity uh, through Amazon Smile program, uh, click on that link. If you're not supporting anyone, feel free to look up Fully Informed Jury Association. Um, and when you buy through this smile link, there's a teensy tiny uh, little, uh, little kickback to the charity of your choice. And I'm also sharing with you a page uh, for how you can get involved with FIJA, how you can sign up for our email list, what things are coming up. If I'm correct, on my screen, you should now see <laughs> Um, the upcoming, uh, the upcoming uh, webinar that will be, I'm sorry, it's not 26 July, it's 6 July. I have a, a little typo there, um, but it, it's correct on the next page on the Fiji website. Um, but that will be a conversation with Professor James Banal on his book, 20 Million Angry Men, in which he makes the case that people who have been convicted of felonies should be included in jury service. So that, that, was, that came to mind when uh, you, Mike, were talking about how other than jury nullification, there's nothing that a, a lay juror would be better at than a, a judge. And I thought, well, this person kind of has an idea of what's going on in, in, in prison. So maybe, maybe something like that. I don't know. I have to give that some more thought because that was a very thought provoking uh, comment. Yeah. Um, so anyway, thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. I am so looking forward to this book coming out. And as we get closer, I will be, uh, well, first of all, I'll be sharing a recording of this as soon as I get it edited. 
Um, and I will post that on the uh, Facebook page and uh, it'll be on our YouTube channel. But as we get closer to the book actually coming out, I will be scheduling a book discussion group on that and we'll definitely be sharing this again. So thank yep. you to everyone who joined us on Zoom on Facebook. Thank you to everyone who's uh, about to watch this uh, at some point, watch the recording. And uh, I think with that, I'm gonna let everyone go. We look forward to seeing you again. Okay, thank you. It's Thanks. been fun.